as okay, a, can can you hear me? As an idea is out of the window. Yeah. Yes, great. So, Choi. Yes. So, without further ado, let me just do the honors because I'm super excited that um, I get to meet Giancarlo at this conference, and I'm very excited to be sitting at the table here as the chair or as the local representative proxy, whatever. Um, when he gives his talk. So I just want to welcome Giancarlo to the workshop. And I'm very excited about his talk and the floor is all yours. Thanks a lot, Matthias. And thanks everyone for the invitation. I'll try to do something very ambitious here. We should talk about this thing I've been uh, obsessing with recently, which is the connection between semantics in the sense of real world semantics, ontology and explanation. And this is a particular notion of explana explanation that we call uh, ontological unpacking. So again, it's about the three uh, notions, and uh, I will try in a very short time to defend that, uh, you know, any explanation worth its salt is strongly connected to ontology and to semantics. Um, this is a reflect, you know, we, we you uh, discussed this a lot in this paper. If people are interested, uh, I would, you know, welcome feedback and invite them to take a look at this paper. So I'll start with the joke. So here we have uh, from, from Tom Gold, which I think is a brilliant uh, cartoonist. Have you noticed that the farmer has been using the words ham, bacon, and sausage a lot lately? It's, yeah, what do you think they mean? I'm going to find out. And then Big Let's Go to the Library comes back and says, Maurice, I've got some very bad news. So if you understood the joke, it's not because of this. It's not because of a mapping from a piece of mathematics to another piece of mathematics. Right, not this notion of semantics. It's because you understand the whole ontology behind this domain. So, what are what are the relations between ham, bacon, sausage, and Maurice and his friend? Right, that these are things, products which are constituted by pork, which bear some relations, some historical dependence relation with instance of the class pig, of which Maurice and his friends uh, friends are instance. So, in order to understand this. You need to understand the semantics of these terms in terms of an ontology of the domain, in terms of all these elements and their uh, relations. So here, the, the distinction is between this notion of formal semantics and the notion of real-world semantics or ontological semantics. Any information artifact that is not just a piece of mathematics will have real-world semantics, which is the same thing as saying that it will make an ontological you commit to a certain worldview. So the most new data of database, take this one, for example, believes quote unquote in the existence of people who can believe in or disease of transplants and roles that people can play in these transplants, like surgeons, donors, and duties. Even things like you know the subway map of Amsterdam. If this thing makes any sense to you, uh, it's because of this real world semantics, because of this mapping from this to a given ontology of the world in which there are lines, uh, you know, uh, lines composed of certain stations ordered in a certain way, making intersections with order lines and so on. Well, how does this connect to FAIR? Well, the focus here is on the interoperability of FAIR. Uh, you probably noticed that the definition, let's say, of FAIR is recursive, right? So you say that an information artifact is FAIR and it's interoperable if described by artifacts that are fair. So things are interoperable if defined by things which are interoperable. So what 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 is to be interoperable in this context, right? Interoperability is basically, so if you have any information artifact, any database here commits to a given ontology of the domain, different database will commit to different ontologies to semantically interoperate this database is basically finding out the connections between the two ontologies, it's interoperating the two ontologies, right? Finding out the relation, for example, between person on the left and person on the right, or transplant on the left and transplant on the right. So we cannot assume that just because we are using the same lexical terms here, that this relation should be one of identity. Well, again, if we look at back to the map of Amsterdam, and if I ask you, how, how can I go from the slot bag to the pay? And you tell me, you know, take the moon 50 line, the green line in, the, in that direction of the and then you stop at the south station and you take the blue line to, you know, in the north direction, and then you can stop at the pay. 
Why is this a good explanation, right, to this why question? What makes this as a valid, good explanation is, again, things in the world, lines having certain, composed of certain stations in certain orders having certain, certain uh, intersections. This is related to a notion of ontology, which is uh, what is called the ontological explanation, which was put forth by, by this philosopher called T.Y. Kell in this uh, nice paper called Ontology and Scientific Explanation, in which she says, whenever we have something important but difficult to understand, we should focus our attention on finding what the primary entities in the domain under investigation are. Discovering these entities and their intrinsic and structural properties rather than manipulating uninterpreted or ill-interpreted mathematical symbols or speculating on free-floating universal laws and principles is the real-world work of science. Mathematical formalism and universal laws and principles are relevant and important only when they have a firm ontological basis. Sorry for reading this, but I find it so beautiful. I wish I had written this myself. So this idea that to explain is that it's to reveal this, it's to reveal uh, the ontology behind the, the propositions that constitute our why questions, that answer our why questions. So again, this map is a set of propositions, right? A set of truth bearers. What we need to do is to move from truth bearers to uh, truth makers. And just to give you an idea about this, suppose we have this uh, knowledge graph. Right, so we have here that uh, John works for the University of Bolzano. John is married to Mary. He's the husband of Mary. Mary is the wife of John. And Mary cannot work for the University of Bolzano. This is a perfect set of propositions or a perfect description, a knowledge graph, if you like. However, it has, it's a description, but it has zero explanatory power. It tells me nothing for why it's true that John worked for the University of Bolzano, if he does. What makes true that John is married to Mary, and why it's true that John is prohibited to work for the universe of Bolzano? So again, in order to do that, we need to explain what makes that true, which is this employment relation between John and Bolzano. What makes true that John is married to Mary, their marriage? What is a marriage as a bundle of commitments and claims and rights and subjections and powers and so on? Some of which. Um, will uh, commit Mary to, to an omission, to apply to positions in places where uh, John uh, works, right? So again, we want to move from descriptive models that reveal, uh, that just describe truth bearers to models that, would, that are explanatory because they reveal certain uh, truth makers. So we've been doing this in a number of different domains. So if people are interested uh, uh, this is an interesting paper in which we do this for a viral uh, conceptual model to take the model and to unpack the model. By the way, the, the, the use of the term um, unpacking here is not accidental. The word explanation in all Latin languages mean, uh, means literally to unfold, to unpack things. So let me try with the uh, do the second part of the presentation as fast as I can, which is to illustrate this, not in the domain of virus, but in something which is much simpler. Suppose we have a model like this. You know, the person, uh, a person is, has a, ser a more serious medical condition than another person, and a person is treated in zero to many, by tre treated by zero to many healthcare providers. Healthcare provider treats one to many persons. Again, perfect description, no explanatory power. It's not telling us what does it mean for a person to have a more serious condition than another person? What does it mean for someone to be treated by a healthcare provider? So let's take a look at this relation. Well, we can analyze this relation. In other words, perform an ontological analysis of this relation and try to answer this question. What is in the world that would make that uh, proposition true in case it is true? So suppose John and Bob are both uh, sick, they have pathological medical conditions, and John has a, uh, a more serious medical condition. Bob has a more serious medical condition than John. If they both have medical conditions, and Bob has at least one medical condition that is more severe than all the medical conditions of John. I'm making this up, right? But let's suppose this is, this is a, an explanation for that. 
So you have a bunch of these positions in here in, in then, um, and this these positions will have certain qualities which are their severity. And then this the severity is a linear conceptual space, and they are ordered in the in a circle, right? So by the way, the meta properties of that relation. So the relation of having a more serious medical condition is a what is called a comparative relation or a form of relation, and therefore reducible to intrinsic properties of the relata, right? So there is no real connection here between Paul and John. What you have is a, a relation between the values of this, uh, the severity of these qualities or dispositions. And that's why this relation is a totally ordered relation, because the underlying conceptual space here of severity is totally ordered. So here we have the person, the pathological medical conditions, the severity level of these pathological conditions. You can have a certain taxonomy of pathological medical conditions and so on. And then we have a bunch of relations. We have this having a more serious medical condition, the original relation reduced to uh, a relation between uh, modes, dispositions, qualities, which reduce to relations between abstract entities, which are values in this conceptual spaces. Here we have a distinction between different types of entities. We have substantials or endurance or continuance like, like John and Bob, and we have their pathological medical conditions, which are aspects, moments, uh, dependent entities. So in the middle of all concrete and abstract and these object aspects and intrinsic aspects. If you look at this relation of characterization, it's a, another type of relation, right? So this is a relation of existential dependence. What is the truth maker of uh, So we're looking at these three relations. The one here of existential dependence or endurance, and these relations, these comparative relations, and that original relation between severity levels, these are very different kinds of relations that have very different types of truth makers. So again, a typology of relations here, we have primitive relations like greater than, so five is greater than three. The truth makers are five and three. It's by their very nature that they are ordered in this way. Existential dependence, John's headache, and John, the fact that, 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 that there is that inherence, inherence relation, the truth makers are the headache. It's by the very nature of that headache that it appears in John. Now, in contrast, we have this grounded relation, right? That the truth makers are not the, uh, the relata, but comparative relations, the truth makers are intrinsic aspects, not truly relational aspects, like the pathological conditions of John and Bob. Now, here, it's not the case that all people have pathological medical conditions. We can refine this model. Here we have that there are different states of people, different bases, healthy people and unhealthy uh, people, and unhealthy people will have pathological conditions. So we have a distinction between different types of types here. Then we look at this yet another type of relation, this relation of being treated by. So what is the truth maker of this relation? If it is true that John is treated by the um, Twenty medical hospital, it's not because of the existence, the sheer existence of John and Twenty medical hospital, and it's not reducible to intrinsic properties of John and the Twenty medical hospital. Something else truly relational must exist in the world binding uh, John to the Twenty medical hospital. So this is what is called a material relation, like the example of John working for the University of Bolzano. The truth maker of that relation, again, is the employment, right? Here, it's the, uh, the, the three. Now, because this notation here and this description is not revealing this truth maker, we have an inherent ambiguity in this cardinality constraint. So what does it mean to say that a person is treated by one, zero to many healthcare providers? Well, there are many ways of, of doing this. I'm just speeding up here on these distinctions. What does it mean to say that a patient is treated by one to too many healthcare providers? Well, there are at least eight different interpretations here, right? That given a treatment, you can have one patient, several healthcare providers, they can both participate in any treatment. 
given a treatment, have one patient, one healthcare provider that can both participate in many treatments. You can have many patients, many healthcare providers that can all participate in many treatments, and so on and so forth, right? You have all these different semantics for that relation, real world semantics for that relation, that are collapsing one single representation because this truth maker of the relation is hidden. The truth maker, what we call a relator, a truly relational aspect, must be explicitly represented. And once it's represented there, we can eliminate this. Right? So here we make clear that a treatment connects one patient and one healthcare provider, they both can participate in treatments, and the same patient can be treated by the same healthcare provider multiple times. That's what, what this notation is representing. And therefore, we can differentiate, for example, these two models, which would otherwise be identical. If you just look at the lower parts, right? So if you look at the lower part of the models, they are they have the same types, the same relations, the same parental constraints, but these are very different semantics for this for this relation of being treated by, as we can see once we review the truth maker of that. Right? So the treated on in the top. Uh, model, we have treatments which are exclusive for patients and healthcare provider. In the bottom part, we have treatments that can be collective treatments and with multiple healthcare providers. Again, we are going from this, this whole process of unpacking, which I compressed in my presentation. We'll take this model from here to here. So again, the difference between these two models is not just one of expressivity, but it's one of nature. We are moving from a focus on description to a focus on explanation, a focus from truth bearers uh, to one on uh, with truth makers. So to explain in this sense is to review the ontological commitment or to review the real world semantics behind them all. And that's what we need for semantic interoperability, right? because we don't want to have that case of false agreement in which we think we are talking about the same thing, but that the conditions in which uh, those relations would occur would be very different. Now, very quickly, let me uh, talk about two things. One is that thing over there, which is that part of the model, is an instance of a pattern. In fact, in every case of material relation, we would have an instantiation of this pattern. You have the truth maker, you have this derivation relation, which you can think of truth making or grounding. We have uh, constraints on this carnality constraint, uh, constraints, and you have the definition of what it is to expand in that relation. When does that relation hold? When there is a relator binding the things in a certain way. This makes this uh, process of unpacking using a language like this, that is a language whose modeling primitives are ontological design patterns, uh, makes it, brings this very close to a particular approach to explanation in philosophy of science, which is called the unificatory approach uh, proposed by Kitcher. The idea here is that in his words, science advances our understanding of nature by showing us how to derive descriptions of many phenomena using the same patterns of derivation again and again. So to explain is a process of theoretical reduction. It's saying, look, this thing that you are surprised by is just another instance of that thing that you already understand. It's also connected to this notion of explanation, again, in philosophy of science, proposed by the philosopher Paslan Flassin, which is notion of pragmatic explanation, right? And very quickly, one, pragmatic explanation puts um, an emphasis on the background and uh, of the explanation seeker. So to explain is to satisfy the explanation goals of the explanation seeker. Let me give you a, a, a very simple example. If someone comes to your house and looks at the microwave and asks you, how does that work? Your explanation won't involve microwaves at all, right? Unless the person is a physicist, right? Your, typically your explanation would be like put things inside turn the knob, press the button, set the timer, and so on. So you are creating an abstraction of what's going on there, which is ultimately grounded on microwaves to satisfy the goals of the explanations. So why questions in the, in the pragmatic explanations, in my view, are what competence questions should be for our problems. We can have a separate discussions on that. But I think we really need to uh, 
take competence questions seriously and move from this view of competence questions as lookup queries to uh, competence questions as requests, for example. Another interesting point here is the, uh, in uh, Van Frassen's approach is this notion of contrastive questions. Very quickly, here, take the difference. So when we have, why is a person treated by a given healthcare provider? There are two implicit questions here, which can be refined by this uh, contrast classes. So here it is, why is a person treated by a given healthcare provider as opposed to not being treated? And the answer is because they have pathological medical conditions because they are unhealthy. And here is the answer to the other question, as opposed to being treated by a different healthcare provider, right? You're treated by that healthcare provider because of the existence of that treatment binding you to uh, the healthcare provider. Finally, this notion of explanation by from Frassen, as I already explained, uh, is closely connected to a notion of complexity management. So to explain is to filter out the tape, it should declutter, it should simplify, which by the way, connects to the other etym et etymology of explanation, let's say in Germanic language, in Dutch, for example, verklaring or outlet means to simplify, to make it plain, not to unfold. So they are con contrasted notions, right? In one sense, you are unpacking, and adding complexity and details. On the other sense, you're removing all the details which are um, not germane to the problem you are trying to, to solve. Now, very, very quickly, the last part of my presentation, how this, I mean, I should say something about explaining AI. Right? So the, in, in a nutshell, the, 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 the two lines here in explaining AI right? for explanation, one is you mimic the, the behavior of the black box by generating a symbolic artifact. So this idea, of what is called inherently interpretable home models. I mean, I should, if I succeed at all in this presentation, you should be very suspicious of this sentence, right? That there are no models that are inherently interpretable, just in virtue of being symbolic. And the second approach, which is this explainability framework or the partial model approach, uh, in which you are trying to uh, generate again a symbolic artifact, but it's not meant to reflect the whole behavior of the black. Again, the point that I think this two approach is sent in the, in the false um, premise that symbolic artifacts are self-explanatory. So to explain in this approach is to generate a symbolic artifact that is either equivalent to the behavior of the black box, believed to be equivalent to the behavior of the, the black box, or not, or partially, but they are symbolic artifacts. And because of, of that, they are explanations. Well, look, this is a symbolic artifact, extremely simple set of propositions in a language that has a formal semantics. I hope to have convinced you that this, this, this has no explanatory power, right? Of course, you can take a neural network and generate a decision tree. I mean, we know that for 30 years. And again, why are people surprised? These are just functions, right? Neural networks is a complex function, a decision tree is a complex function. They can be shown to be equivalent to a set of descriptions anyway, in, in the description logic sense, but these are not explanations. If you generate this immense decision, uh, decision tree for a neural network, in what sense is that inherently uh, interpretable? Um, we discussed, for example, in this other paper, which we Submit by invitation to the Neurosymbolic AI Journal, in which we discuss this multiple roles of homology and explanation. We actually revisit the work of uh, Roberto that shows that using lightweight ontologies, you can actually increase the interpretability of decision trees. But that's still not the point. Now, let's look just to conclude to this other approach, which is the approach of counterfactual explanations, right? Which the, let's say, most prominent black box approach. And they would look like this, right? You are denied a loan because your annual income was 30,000 pounds. If your income had been 45,000 pounds, you have been offered a loan. So to explain is to offer these counterfactual scenarios. I won't have the time to go into details, but I invite you to read this paper, which is quite nice, in which the authors show beautifully that unless you uh, satisfy some conditions, counterfactual explanations are indistinguishable from adversarial examples. 
right? They are the definition of adversarial examples. And the only way to differentiate them is if the explanation are formulated in terms of um, dimensions that would have a real words in place. And again, uh, I, I, I like this quote by uh, Wallet in which he say, representations in ne neural networks are not really signs that correspond to anything interpretable. They are distributed for relative and continuous invariant values. A hidden unit cannot on its own represent any object that's metaphysically meaningful. So we have absolutely no idea how to, I, to make, to guarantee that the only dimensions which are used in these counterfactual explanations would look like things like this, like loans and annual incomes and, and so on. Right? These are just values, these are just weights. And even if we could, again, this is not self-explanatory, just in virtue of being symbolic. So just to conclude, these are my takeaway methods. No explanation without semantics, no semantics without ontology, and no ontology without ontology in the capital. That's it. Thank you.